In this video, we're going to look into the question, is war a war crime? And we're going to do so in the context of the Israel-Hamas war, now that it's six months after the October 7th massacre that started it. The topics I'll cover in this video are, is there a genocide or a holocaust in Gaza? The world's central kitchen convoy attack? The issue of food shortage and starvation in Gaza? And finally, who to believe in this conflict? Let's start with the issue of genocide. Israel is being accused of committing a genocide or a holocaust against the Palestinians in Gaza. Let's first understand what is the definition of a genocide from Encyclopedia Britannica. Genocide, the deliberate and systematic destruction of a group of people because of their ethnicity, nationality, religion, or race. Now it's obvious that Israel doesn't care about the ethnicity, nationality, religion, or race of the people in Gaza. The only thing it cares about are brutal, barbaric, bloodthirsty militants who want to destroy it that is, Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Israel does not target Gazans for being Gazans, Muslims for being Muslims, Arabs for being Arabs, or Mediterraneans for being Mediterraneans. The claims against Israel dilute the concept of genocide. They trivialize the horror. Here are some selected examples of real genocides from the 20th century. I've placed them in chronological order. The Armenian Holocaust, perpetrated by the Turks, roughly one million were murdered. The Jewish Holocaust in World War II, roughly 6 million Jews murdered. The Cambodian Genocide, roughly 2 million. The Rwandan Genocide, roughly half a million. Here is what type of atrocities occur in genocide. Villages are wiped out completely, including all men, women, and children being executed or murdered. People are killed in gas chambers, in death marches. They are tortured, raped, and mutilated. In some cases, the civilian population is also encouraged to participate in the killing. Hmm, except for the gas chamber, this sounds awfully like October 7th massacre, by the way. Anyway, one key factor in all of the above is that civilians are purposely targeted. Now here is what Israel is doing. It tries to target armed terrorists hiding behind civilian population while minimizing civilian casualties and providing water, food, and other aid to the civilian population. So there can be no doubt that this is not a genocide. Accusing Israel of committing a genocide is simply an illegitimate criticism. No intellectually honest person can claim this, and yet many intellectuals do. What does it say about them? A legitimate criticism would be that Israel should do more to avoid civilian casualties. I completely agree with this. But the Israeli army does a lot to protect the civilian population. For example, it created evacuation corridors and asked the local population to evacuate away from the war zones. Hamas, on the other hand, set up blockades and prevented them from doing so, as it would lose its human shield. In some cases, Israel had to fight Hamas to open these checkpoints and allow the civilians to move away. Israel also does something called roof knocking in which it warns the residents of a building that it's going to destroy it because it's being used by terrorists. You have to remember, this war is conducted in one of the most densely populated areas in the world against an enemy whose whole strategy is based on using the local population as human shields. There are tunnels underneath civilian areas and centers. Schools and hospitals are being used by terrorists. A strike example of this is the second raid on the Al-Shifa hospital, one of the IDF's most brilliant moves so far. The IDF pretended to leave the hospital, high-ranking Hamas terrorists returned to it, and then the IDF raided it again, killing and capturing many terrorists. There's also the issue of comparing numbers. Let me first say that each death is horrible and sad, both of civilians and combatants. War is tragic. But let's try to understand how many civilians died in this war so far compared to militants. Current casualty reports by Hamas at the time of making this video is 33,000 dead. The reports does not distinguish between combatant and civilian casualties. Even if we believe these numbers, about 20 out of the 24 Hamas regiments have been destroyed, and even assuming only 50% of them were actually killed in combat, this gives about 12,500 combatants. Israel claims that it killed 13,000 combatants, so the numbers add up. That's a ratio of 1.5 to 1. That is, 1.5 civilian casualties for every combatant casualty. Let's compare this 1.5 to 1 ratio to other wars in the world. Now, I took these numbers out of Wikipedia, and they are rough estimates, as the estimates for the casualties themselves vary widely. 
I took the middle point between estimates and rounded them. World War II. The German side had a 1 to 2 ratio, so better than the current war. The Japanese side had 1 to 3 ratio, again better. The Korean War is considered one of the worst in terms of civilian casualties. For North Korea, the ratio was 8 to 1, so much worse than the current war. The Vietnam War, North Vietnam had a 1 to 1.5, so better. War in Afghanistan had about 1 to 1, better. The Iraq War had about 2 to 1, which is worse. Some say that the 1.5 to 1 ratio is quite good considering the dense urban warfare and human shields tactics used by Hamas. But at least we can say they look in the ballpark of other wars. Now let's compare this ratio to the genocides mentioned earlier. Even if we assume that in each one of these genocides, thousands of people took arms to combat the genocide, we are still looking at numbers that are thousandfold higher. Armenians around 1,000 to 1, Jewish around 6,000 to 1, Cambodian 2,000 to 1, Rwandan 500 to 1. So how can anyone claim a genocide with a straight face? So yes, war is terrible, it's hell, it's tragic, but war is not a war crime. A country has the right to defend itself, especially against a brutal enemy who vows its destruction. We didn't start this war, we don't want this war, but we want our hostages and we want to be safe. Moving on to the next point, the attack on the World Central Kitchen aid convoy. A few days ago, on April 1st, 2024, the IDF mistakenly killed seven aid workers in Gaza. While this is obviously tragic, these things unfortunately happen in war. War is hell, war is chaos. Innocent people die in wars, aid workers die in wars. Now, Israel is blamed harshly for this. Some even ventured to claiming that Israel does so on purpose. Like this Al Jazeera video titled, Did Israel intentionally target the WCK convoy in Gaza? Even those who don't venture this far often claim that this is a sign that Israel doesn't regard high enough or doesn't do enough to protect human lives, and specifically civilians in war. This is of course not true. First, it's important to note that these kind of incidents happen in all wars. Again, because war is hell and war is chaos. For example, two and a half years ago, the US killed 10 people in Afghanistan, an aid worker and his family. Here is a snapshot of a BBC article reporting it. I guess most people in the West, and especially in the US, don't claim the US is evil and did so intentionally. Moreover, the World Central Kitchen itself has accidentally killed five Gazans when one of their food drops fell over and crushed civilians. Here is an article from The Guardian in case you don't believe me. What was their response to this tragic accident? Well, hear it for yourself. Here is an interview with Chef José Andres, the founder and leader of WCK, referring to this incident. I was in plane with him delivering food into Gaza. Things happen, malfunctions happen. Was unbelievably unfortunate that those um, uh, planes were some mar parachutes uh, malfunction or the calculations of the load that those parachutes could handle was not done in the right way. That same chef is now outraged against Israel that seven of his staff died. What was Israel's response? Israel already started an investigation on the matter, took full responsibility. The strike on the aid vehicles is a grave mistake stemming from a serious failure due to a mistaken identification, errors in decision making, and an attack contrary to the standard operating procedures. It already took disciplinary actions against those involved, including impeaching the commanding colonel, Nochi Mendel, in this picture. And this is still not the end of the process. This is happening only days after the unfortunate attack. What happened to the ones who were responsible for the attack in Kabul, you wonder? Well, nothing. No one was punished and it was deemed a tragic mistake. I guess the world can't be so forgiving for Jews. The next point in this video is about the possible starvation in Gaza. The accusation brought up by the Palestinian and their allies is that Israel is using starvation as a war tactic. Here you can see a headline from some anti-Israel NGO. Starvation used as a weapon of war in Gaza. This couldn't be farther from the truth. First thing to notice is that this has been pumped up by Palestinians for six months now, and yet there are no mass deaths and mass famine-related diseases. Famine by February warned Al Jazeera in December. Well, it's April now. Where's the famine? 
Another article in AP around the same time said more than half a million are in catastrophic starvation levels. How did they survive four more months? Another report in CNN from January quotes UNICEF warning that 10,000 children will suffer life-risking malnutrition within weeks. It's been three months. So is the threat of starvation serious or exaggerated? By the way, the claims of starvation in Gaza are not new. They were used before the war as well. Here is a Guardian piece from 2019 warning that if relief will be withdrawn, there will be famine. And here is another one warning about famine. And get this, it's from two months before the October 7th massacre. Wow, they were so hungry, so in need for funding, yet they had enough money for building mass underground tunnels, producing tens of thousands of missiles. They had money for RPGs and guns. I don't know, strange. Since the beginning of the war, Israel allowed aid to enter. Currently, Israel places no limits on the amount of aid that can enter Gaza, and absolutely does not limit the entrance of food. Israel also facilitates entry of complementary products such as cooking gas and diesel fuel for the operation of the aid centers. In fact, more food has entered Gaza in the past month than the month prior to the war. Israel makes the data public. Here's an official informatic showing how much aid entered Gaza since the war and how much on a specific date. Here, the 4th of April. It updates it regularly. The main problem is not allowing aid to enter, but distributing it within Gaza. This is done by the UN and aid organizations. Why can't Israel distribute the food, you ask? It can't because Israeli soldiers will be sitting ducks for Hamas terrorists in this case. In addition to the ongoing fighting, one of the main problems inside Gaza is Hamas. Hamas has been stealing and looting a big portion of the aid, which doesn't help the situation. Yet no one is blaming Hamas of using starvation of its own people as a war crime. That's odd. Since you might not believe me, here is an interview with a brave Gaza woman accusing Hamas of stealing the aid. An important tool to find truth in the age of disinformation is to check what are the interests of both sides in the conflict. Israel has absolutely no interest in starving Gaza or targeting civilians or aid workers. This undermines Israel's legitimacy to wage war in the world eye. Its sole purpose is to destroy Hamas and other militants in order to protect itself. Hamas, on the other hand, has all the interest in portraying Israel as a villain and the situation in Gaza as catastrophic. This puts immense pressure from the world on Israel to end the war with Hamas still in power. The use of propaganda and world pressure on Israel is an old Palestinian tactic that has been used in all previous conflicts. So the starvation in Gaza claim is highly doubtful. But you know where there is no doubt? There is no doubt that there is starvation in Africa. About 43,000 people died of starvation in Somalia alone last year. People are dying right now out of starvation in Sudan. And 150 million are in danger. Did you hear about this in the media? Does it seem like the world cares? Why is that? And you know who else is starving? The hostages. Hamas has already reported that one 34-year-old hostage died of starvation. At least 35 Israeli hostages died in Gaza captivity. Most of them bear signs of execution. Where's the world outcry? The next and final point that is really mind-boggling for me, personally, is how the world, and mostly the media, react to claims made by both parties. Claims made by Palestinians are immediately believed, while those made by Israel are met with skepticism and suspicion. For example, the Al-Akhli hospital explosion. Hamas claimed immediately after the explosion that Israel bombed the hospital and that there were 471 dead. All the media outlets just ate it up and reported Hamas' version as the truth. Israel said that it will conduct an investigation and after a day released its version and proved that it was actually a failed missile launch that Gazan militants fired against Israel. Not only was this not done by Israel, but the numbers themselves were blown up extensively, where the actual numbers might be lower than 100 casualties. It wasn't even the hospital that was hit, but an adjacent parking lot. So many lies and inaccuracies in this one story, yet the world immediately believed it gullibly. On the other hand, let's look at the sexual violence used by Hamas, both on October 7th and on the hostages. 
In the picture here, you can see Amit Sosna, who was released from Hamas captivity and came forward publicly to say that she was sexually assaulted by her captors. Now, when the claims of sexual violence first appeared immediately after October 7th, they were met with great disbelief by both Palestinians, pro-Palestinians, but also, get this, by women organizations across the globe, such as UN Women. We want proof, they said. Now, if the standard of we don't believe you until we see hard evidence was applied to any sexual violent crimes, okay. But of course, the regular stance in the West is that of believe all women. I'm not saying this stance is right, I'm just pointing to the world hypocrisy when it comes to Jews. The hypocrisy of this led to protests of Israeli and Jewish women with the hashtag Me Too unless you're a Jew. There are mounting evidence of the sexual crimes and the women organizations finally acknowledge that, but the initial suspicion is upsetting. Contrast this to the claims of sexual violence against Yazidi women in Iraq. When they started to pop up, did anyone question it? Here is an article from The Guardian. Any demand for evidence? These are just two small examples, but the question is, how can we explain this? On the one hand, you have a liberal democracy with a free press, gay rights, which is highly critical of itself and of its leaders, a history of honesty, of admitting mistakes and of taking responsibility for them. On the other hand, you have an Islamist terrorist autocracy, zero human rights, takes zero responsibility for everything that happens to them, even on their decision to wage brutal wars, and who is caught lying time and time again, in fact uses lying as one of its resources in its asymmetric warfare. The gay issue is also mind-boggling. You have organizations like Queers for Palestine. You can be queer in Israel, but you absolutely cannot be gay in Palestine, especially not in Gaza. Hamas executes gays, even if they are top loyal commanders who deny that they are gay and there are no real evidence against them. The case of Mahmoud Ishtivi is noteworthy. He was a top commander of Hamas, and they tortured him endlessly and finally executed him. So, is war a war crime? Apparently it's not if you're Hamas, if you're the US, etc. But if you're Israel? I'll stop here. Let me just say that I hope and pray that the war will end soon, that the surviving hostages will be released, that the Palestinians will finally accept the existence of Israel, and that true peace will be made in the region. That's all for this video.